you need us to zoom in a bit or no? That's no, I like to be able to, if he uses his hands, I want to be able to see him. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So you 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 major in education or? No, actually I studied journalism and Spanish. Oh, okay. So yeah, I do public relations now. With well, what company you were? Uh, it's called Munoz Public Relations. Who? Munoz. Munoz. Public relations. Mm -hmm. We are downtown. Yeah, I know. I've, I've, uh, I'm trying to. Because uh, I, 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 you know, I used to have uh, when I got out of service. Uh, I opened some McDonald's franchise here. And let's see, I need to read this. It says, Okay. Uh, my name is Nora Frost. Today's date is May 3rd, 2008. I am interviewing um, Mr. Abel Bella for the U.S. Latino and Latina World War II Oral History Project. We are sitting in San Antonio, Texas at the Veterans Center. In, uh, and... Uh, Thank you, Mr. Bella, for joining us and agreeing to be interviewed today. Thank you. Uh, tell me a little bit about your family and what daily life was like in Beeville, Texas, in the valley. Okay, let me start. Uh, we were, uh, my father was a sharecropper. So we work a farm. He worked for the, the owner of this farm, and uh, he took care of all the uh, duties and the farm, taking care of the pigs, the cows, the chickens, and of course they raised a lot of cotton in that area. And uh, we uh, we not only worked that farm, but as soon as we get through with our farm, we went and started working other farms, picking cotton, corn, uh, whatever was available at that time. Uh, and uh, it was a uh, Hard life for us because we went to work when just could barely see, and then we came back when just could barely see too, early in the morning and late at night. Um, of course, um, my dad and my mom, they're all both are from Mexico. My mother and my dad, they had a third grade education. They came to the United States to uh, make a living and, and to raise a family. Uh, so uh, it was a wor very hard working individual. And that's why I think I, I, I picked up my work ethics, uh, uh, working with him, working. But we all worked, my mother, my brother, my sister. I have a brother and I have a sister. Because both of them passed away, I'm the only one left now. And we enjoy it very much. Uh, once a week, we would go to Beeville, and my dad would uh, buy us an ice cream cone. It was one of the treats that we got. And we sit on the curb of the street and, and eat it. Then we come on home, get a box of popcorn, and nurse it for the whole week until we got back the next, next weekend. Uh, and, uh, my dad got sick, uh, so there was no there was no help for us over there in in, uh, in that area. We didn't live in Beaver. We lived outside Beaver. Pony, as a little town, had one one gas station and one grocery store. So when my dad got sick, my mother and we needed some help. So they recommended for us to move to San Antonio because my dad had uh, tuberculosis and we could get some help over here. So we moved to San Antonio, moved to the west side, uh, and, and uh, this, we were getting help from welfare, from the Red Cross, and also from a church that we, that we joined, American Lutheran Church right close to our house on Veracruz Street. And my mom also worked. She, she made tortillas, uh, and while we went to school, we went to a private school initially. It was just a house, and because uh, the only language we could speak was Spanish, so we went to this uh, friend's house next door, and she had a little class for us. And then later on, we went to uh, public school. I went to uh, David Barclay Elementary School uh, on the west side. And then from there, I went to Lanier High School, 
because at that time uh, the middle school and high school were together. In 1944, uh, as soon as graduated, I volunteered to go in the army. The other thing that uh, that uh, helped me make a decision to join the service was my my brother, who was older than I am. He was in the navy, and I thought I could get in the navy because I, I liked the way the navy, the way he talked to me about the navy. It was a nice place to be, nice uniform, good food, three meals a day. So I said, well, I'm volunteer. I volunteer, but I couldn't. Nobody would take me except the Army, so I went in the Army. I'm glad I did, because uh, I, I really enjoy every, every day uh, being in the service. What was it like um, being a high school student at Lanier here in San Antonio? Was it predominantly Hispanic students that were at Lanier, or was there a cross-section of other ethnicities? No, most of, uh, most of us were Hispanics because uh, I was in the West Side, very few Anglos. So uh, I couldn't uh, participate in a lot of uh, activities because I had to work. I work in the evenings. Uh, I used to sell fruit. I used to uh, deliver newspaper, uh, shine shoes because my dad was still sick and we had to uh, take care of him. And he finally recovered and, and uh, went to work for Swift and, and Company as a butcher. But uh, all of us had to work, my brother and I. The only thing I did in high school is that I joined the uh, ROTC program and I played in the, in the band, I played drums. And there was one, the only uh, free time that I had is when I go to the games, and I knew if I if I joined the band, I could see the f games for free. Do you have a favorite memory of going to high school, or maybe with your family growing up? Oh, there's many many memories that I, that I uh, that I can recall. The teachers were very helpful. They were very dedicated. One of the teachers that I really got along with was Mrs. Hiron. She was my Spanish teacher. And uh, uh, she was always asking, she was concerned about not only me, but my family. And, and also Mr. Brew, the principal, very nice individual. And of course, all my friends that I, that I, that I went to school of course, now most of them uh, all shake uh, and move here in San Antonio. Judge Teniente, Dr. Bernal, uh, uh, the the other individuals that uh, that I know that uh, some of them have businesses, Frank Sepulveda. So those are the memories that I have, um, and and it's. Nice to be back, come back to United, come back to San Antonio, and come back to uh, and, and start your own business here, because you know people and you know who are, how to get around and, and, and uh, some of the obstacles and uh, the rough areas that you hit uh, in business, you you can get help because you have people that get, that you work for and, and you work with, and they have an interest in you. Oh yeah, a lot of segregation. I know uh, when I was a little boy, uh, when I first moved to San Antonio, there's a lot of areas we couldn't go. We couldn't go into San Pedro Park. We couldn't swim over there because we were Hispanics. And uh, I know that uh, later on, when I when I was um, applying for a job, I remember one time I applied for a job for as a taxi driver because then I could work at night and go to school during the day uh, and uh, they were advertising for uh, drivers I went over there there was a big line there was a couple of Anglo guys in front of me 
Oh, behind me, I'm sorry. And uh, when I got to the interviewer, the guy said, no, we, we don't have a job for you. We're full. So I walked out, kept looking. The next guy behind me was Anglo. He got higher. And the second guy behind me, he got higher. So there was a lot of, a lot of prejudice. The only thing that uh, I remember is the few Anglos that were there in, in uh, Lanier, they give you two sandwiches for a, for a taco. So we trade the tacos for, <laughs> for sandwiches. You know? We take beef tacos and they give us a bologna or you know, cheese sandwiches for them. And it was a good deal. You know? Two for one. <laughs> but of course, uh, we were a little uh, uh, embarrassed to bring, you know, the, bring the taco. And we go out, uh, we wouldn't eat in the cafeteria, we go out uh, someplace outside on the bench and eat our, 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 our tortillas. But the Anglo would come over and say, hey, you have tortillas, I'll give you two sandwiches for one, for one tortilla. <laughs> what, so, why was it embarrassing if the school was predominantly Hispanic? Uh, because we don't want them to see, because we were on welfare and we wore they, they, they target us because the, what we wore were, were stuff that we received from welfare. We wore blue jeans and uh, blue, uh, also sh uh, coats. And uh, of course now they're famous, but before you could, and we were trying to hide from this stuff. Hey, I'm not, uh, I'm not a welfare, but they knew we were welfare. So, so that's, that's why it was embarrassing that, uh, and because the, you see a tortilla, um, I don't know, because they make fun of you, you know? Call us a bean tacos, Mr. Taco or a, uh, bean to belly or something like that, <laughs> all kinds of names. <laughs> but there were a few, a few Anglos there that I can remember, yeah. And, and so you decided to join the Army when you were 18, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. At the eight, 18 years old, I, I want I, I was trying to get away from uh, uh, from the barrio because uh, we lived out in a, on a little small home, two rooms, a kitchen, small kitchen, and a small bedroom, and we all slept in one bedroom. My dad, my mom, my brother and sister, and myself. So I felt that uh, hey, there's a better life than this. So I think if I can join the army, I heard that. You know, if you join the army, or join the service, that you get a, you'll be able to get a free education, and by the same way, you're gonna fight. You're fighting for your country, and you, you don't want those uh, crowds, jerrys, to come over and take over your your town. I said no. I said, let me volunteer. Yeah. Did a recruiter come to the school, or no, did you no, hear about it? no. I I uh, I went to the. Uh, I went to the recruiting station and volunteer. I volunteer for the Navy, for the Air Force, and the Marines, and finally the Army said, we'll take you, we'll, we'll train you. So that's, there was no option for me. That's the only option was to go in the Army. And uh, I, like I said, I'm glad I, I joined the Army because I had a good, I was trained w well, and. That can be, uh, te I mean, I can testify by the way I'm, uh, I'm still here <laughs> and I've been in two different wars. So that training and, 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 the, and the equipment that we receive has uh, provided us uh, the safety and the uh, ability to fight the enemy. How, how old were you when the war started? It wasn't, well, it started in, uh, I'm still going to high school. I mean, I just started high school in 1940. I think 1940 or 41 when it started. I, whatever, when the war started, I was I was in uh, Lanier. Mm -hmm. So maybe uh, I was maybe uh, 15 years old. So even then, were you thinking about military? Oh yes, I was. Yes, I was thinking about joining the, the the service and see the world. Travel, and, and I mean, I've only seen I've only seen San Antonio and uh, the Valley, so I want to see something different. But I had a I think I had a cause. I wanted to 
do something for, for my country. After receiving all the help from the Red Cross, from the uh, Welfare Department, uh, I, I feel that I owe something to my country. So uh, there's, there's another. What was your first assignment? <clears throat> my first, I went to Camp Fan in Texas and Tyler to take my training, my basic training. And after some basic training, uh, I went to uh, I went to New York, Port uh, Embarkation, and they t we went overseas. Immediately, as soon as we had eight week training, and we went straight to Europe. And what was your um, assignment there? I was a I was a, a BAR man. Uh, it's a I only weighed 110 pounds, and I think weighed 60 pounds, but I had to carry that there. But I see some guys uh, along with me. They were six foot tall and weighed uh, 100, 200 pounds, and they had a little carbine, and they gave me the BAR, the Brownie Automatic Rifle, they call it. And uh, I, I, I kept that until I got overseas. And uh, so when I got overseas, uh, I couldn't find my outfit because I was infantry. And uh, there was a big battle going in, in, your, in uh, along the German border. And I saw this first sergeant who said, hey, uh, I'm Abel Bell. I, I'm with the infantry. He said, no, you're not with the infantry. You're with me. You're going to, you're going to join the tank destroyers. He said, OK. So I went to join the. So instead of walking, I was riding on uh, half tracks, M10, M10 tanks, uh, jeeps. But uh, the assignment I got was uh, reconnaissance up in front were the eyes and the ears for the uh, tanks, for the tank destroyers. And because uh, we, we get a lot of fire every time we go up to the front. And, uh, what was it like first leaving San Antonio? Well, I I I, uh, I was happy to to leave. I know I was starting a new career. I was going into a, a starting a new journey, and I wanted to do the best that I could do, and do the and did the best that I can to to do my job and my duties, whatever they give me. So I was I was motivated. My whole attitude was positive. I, I never complained in the army, but I heard the other guys complaining. Oh man, I tell you, I should. I wish, I wish I was back with my dad. I would be running the store, or I'd be, you know, doing this for him. And yeah, my dad didn't have a job at that time, so I didn't have to have worry about that. You know, so, so everything they gave me, I, and I try to volunteer everything anytime I want. And you can see, I I volunteered. I volunteered to go in, to go into service. Later on, I volunteered to go to Vietnam. I volunteered to go airborne. Uh, and I volunteered to work for the State Department. When later on, uh, when uh, after my, one of my tours in Vietnam, so I spent a lot of time in Vietnam. I spent from '62 to '69, so a lot of years there. And your family, how how did they feel about having you go to the military? Well, they didn't. Uh, they were very happy because we had uh, we had uh, my brother was in, the, in, in a cousin who had just been killed, and we had a lot of our people, a lot of our uh, cousins uh, and uncles were in the service, and they were not very happy about it. But you know, they said, "You make up your mind, and we'll support you. We'll pray for you." I said, "All I need, all the prayers you can give me." And uh, we'll keep you in. We'll keep in touch. And I, I got letters all the time from my sister, my bro, my my mother. Uh, and uh, so, you know, they they later on they uh, they approved. The one the worst one was when after I finished college, my mother said, "Wait, four years of college, you go back in the army and you're going to jump on those airplanes." I said. I mean, you have to have a degree to jump on the airplane. I said, Mom, that's part of the job. I said, if you, I want to make this a career, and I, to make a career, you have to volunteer for a lot of, 
things that uh, uh, they're dangerous, and uh, uh, you got to prove to the army that you're willing to give your life for your for your country, or for your, or for your soldiers. And in the army, did you experience any segregation or anything like that, or? Not myself, because when I went in, uh, there was no black, uh, they were segregated. The black had their own units and uh, we had our own units. But there was, uh, yeah, there was some, some uh, hard feelings about it. Uh, they always wanted to, hey, why, why, why do you make him a sergeant? I said, I've been here f three years and, you know, I'm Anglo and, and uh, so they thought that I was getting preferential treatment, but it wasn't that. I was doing my job, and I was, I was going the extra mile, mm -hmm. and and uh, that's what counts. In any any place, any I, I don't think any job you do, if you go to the extra mile, you're willing to uh, do your best uh, and stay clean and uh, be on time and. Ask what has to be, you know, and not ask what you have to do for me, it's what can I do for you. you know? And that's my, my philosophy is what can I do for the Army instead of what the Army can do for me. And I think it was the right attitude and it, it paid off. So the Latinos were together with the Anglos? And then yeah, the we were la separate, separate? yeah, we were, we were together, Latinos, we were together with, uh, w with the Anglos. Uh, but the... Uh, Blacks they had their own outfits, and uh, most of them were not in combat. They were quartermaster, signal, uh, service companies, and uh, so I wanted to combat. I wanted this. Uh, I didn't want to be in the in some office typing papers. I, said, I want to be out in the field and be able to guide people, and and uh, and, uh, and that's what helped me when I get I went in. Uh, immediately they made me a. When I on my way overseas, they made me acting corporal because uh, hey, you have ROTC, you have guys. I said we need somebody that has a little military, but this temporary and temporary don't mean nothing, you know. People don't like it when you when I report to my office. I said I wear my stripes. He said, oh, you're a corporal. I said not temporary. I said take them off. <laughs> it's okay. So those guys were they've been there. When I joined my outfit, those people have been there through North Africa, Normandy. I mean, they've, they've been fighting for a couple for a year, you know. And here comes some recruit with with stripes on. You know, I said, wait a minute, you're not gonna, you gotta be baptized first in fire before you get there. So I took them off right away. <laughs> have, have you ever thought of how life would have been like if you wouldn't have joined the army? What would have happened to you once you graduated from Lanier? If I hadn't joined the well, I didn't have the means to, to for education, and I knew that education was very important. I think I would have been, uh, I've been working some, some place uh, as a carpenter or a mechanic or uh, doing woodwork or something like that. Because that's what Lanier wanted to do with me. I said, hey, hey, well, you, you guys are not, uh, you're not cut for that stuff for college. Uh, take uh, go to sh one of the shops and, and learn how to weld or, or learn how to do auto mechanic. That was a whole back back in in, in the, back in the forties. Uh, so I said, no, I want something better than that. I want to prepare myself and uh, be able to serve uh, my country better, be a better citizen, uh, be uh, an asset to the community to my city, uh, to my neighborhood, and, uh, and it proved uh, I was right because uh, uh, when, uh, when I started my business, I was the first Hispanic operator here uh, uh, with McDonald's, and there was some prejudice with McDonald's. They didn't want, a, they didn't want any Hispanics or, or blacks. But since I was uh, I was a veteran, uh, Vietnam veteran, an officer, and I fought it. I went 
if you don't ask for it, you're not going to get it. Mm -hmm. I went all the way to headquarters and took my cot with me and slept there until I, until, uh, I was able to get an interview with, the, with Mr. Croc, the big guy, you know. And uh, finally they said, well, well, where's your money? See, you got to have capital. I said, I don't have any money. I said, I got everything in here. He said, well, no, we can't do that. I said, how about you guys helping me? He said, oh, yeah, we got a program. We can lease you a store, lease it for you, and then uh, later on, within, uh, within two years, we can buy it at a premium. You know? So I said, OK, I'll, I'll do that. I was trying to get a partnership, but they wouldn't let us uh, have partners. You want it all by yourself. So that's how I got in. And, and uh, uh, we had uh, we built our business. Uh, at one time, my son and I, we had uh, had 10 of them at one time. And then we started selling them, because some of them didn't. And again, being a Hispanic, say, hey, my first store was the west side, down at the highest crime area in San Antonio. <laughs> he says, Abel, you've been in combat, you know, and you're Hispanic. You know, you know La Raza. You, you, you start that business. We'll give you one. This way. So I built it. It was a, uh, about $800,000 store, and uh, within three years, we had a $2 million store. But we worked, we worked with the community, with schools, with churches. Uh, on Panuco and, uh, and Commerce, right next to Lady of the Lake. Are you familiar with that area? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, right, ben, uh, right there by the housing area there. And uh, so I had a lot of help. I mean, I, I uh, Cisneros, Mayor Cisneros, I mean, at that time he was a councilman. He lives in that area back over there. Because I, I talked to him and, uh, and uh, the other council people, Richard Teniente was a councilman. Uh, and uh, other people that I knew, and, and they, they they helped me. Yeah. But they when they gave me when they gave me the store, the day I opened, they closed the bridge there on the Amaldorf Bridge, Amaldorf. They were building, and and the first day I opened up, the traffic couldn't go through here. Huh? So the first day I only had I think I had four hundred dollars sales. And I went, I wait. So I went back to city council. I said, hey, the other thing we're going to do, they're going to put a Boulevard through through Commerce all the way up to uh, uh, Jerry McMullen, and people the only way you can get to my store people going going uh, west they had to go all the way to John McMullen come around so I went to City Hall and I put my name on the list and I was able to convince them that uh, that uh, hey I, I can you got to put a you know you got to save my business I got to have at least some place where people can turn into my store. So they were able to, uh, what really helped was uh, uh, at the corner of 24th and, and, and uh, Commerce, uh, there was a, a grocery store. And the guy that uh, owns it was, uh, uh, he got a, he got a uh, in front of the store, they were able to turn around. So I went over there and said, hey, if he can do it, why can I do it? So he said, well, you, you, you council has to approve it. So I went back, and they took everything off. There was no, no boulevard. <laughs> so I was able to save my business. But uh, a site is very important, any type of business. You, yeah. People have to come in, be able to come in and get out easy. Yeah? So. Uh, and what year did you, make, did you build your first McDonald's? First McDonald's, I started in 1970. I put my application. I, got a, I, I retired in seventy. Immediately, I put my name on the list, and uh, in 1974, it took four years to get to get it. Uh, I had a, I had to get a lawyer and really work hard at it, and they finally gave me the uh, the store. Uh, and uh, then the next one, they put me in East Side with black people. <laughs> so I had two stores on the East Side. I mean, you know, hard to deal with, with the, hard to deal with the black people. I tell you, hard to. Deal. I said, look, I'm not prejudiced. Hey, I, I'm Hispanic. He said, no, you, you in with the city and all this stuff. So 
I sold those two stores so as soon as I got, I, uh, I opened them up and worked them over a little bit and then I sold them. And then I had the one on uh, Houston and Pecos. Mm -hmm. Right there by the interstate now, right? Yeah, and you know what's over there? It had that uh, uh, homeless people, you know? Right around the corner, um, the ministry they have over there. And I talked to the police chief uh, at that time was, um, I can't remember who it was. He was an artist or somebody else bef besides that. And yeah, I worked. He said, hey, well, the only thing I can do is uh, call us. Every time you see something wrong, call us. Said, the more calls you get, the more, the more, the more uh, we can do for you. So every five minutes we call. You know? Later on, it, it didn't help me because um, uh, there was an investigation. Somebody, somebody robbed the store. Or oh, who was it? I can't remember what. But they said, "Hey, Abel, you, you guys are, you guys are always in trouble here. You, you got a bad, bad situation here. You, you're not getting along with the community." I said, "Wait a minute." <laughs> I said, "That's not the. The thing is that if you want somebody to hear you, you gotta tell them what's wrong." Or some some kid or some lady got hurt there, or got shot, and and uh, and immediately they start a big investigation. What what type of guards I used? Where were the train? And uh, oh, and it took a year to to take care of that the case. They want to know everything. How it, uh, who trained my guards and uh, what policy McDonald had? And, and it, it was a it was a real tough. I mean, I because I, I had an attorney there, but. It cost me money, and, and, and uh, it was my insurance start jumping up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I guess to get to that situation, uh, being the first Latino owner of McDonald's in San Antonio, obviously um, you credit that with your education. Um, you were in the army for how long, and then you went to back to school to college. I went. I, I was. I spent a total twenty-seven years in the in the service. And uh, if you can look at my record, I went, I went, through, um, I went through all the schools that uh, I'm required to go. Uh, I went to Command and, General, Command and General Staff School, which is one of the top schools that you, that you want to become a general, you have to go through that school. And uh, I completed all my schools, my schools, special forces schools, jump schools, jump uh, master schools, uh, counterinsurgency. Uh, language school. I I speak Vietnamese. I speak German. I speak Spanish, and I speak a little English. But <laughs> enough to get by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a working knowledge of the language. That's good. So how long um, how long were you in Europe before you met your lovely wife? I was there from f forty four to forty six. I was two years, uh, and. Uh, I moved into, uh, see I was in Germany, but then they moved us to Austria. When they divided, they, they divided uh, Germany into four different sectors, the French, English, Americans, and the, and the Russians sector. Then they moved us, uh, they moved me over to the, close to the Russian sector. I worked with the Russians. I have a number of pictures. With, at that time I was a sergeant and, and I, um, I had the, um, we patrolled the, the uh, uh, about, about 100, no, about 70 miles of, of uh, border that we patrolled, that I patrolled my, my, my platoon. I had a reinforced platoon. Uh, I worked with a, a, uh, I worked with a Russian captain. He, he was on the other side. And uh, so at that time, there was a lot of ten tension between the Americans and, and the Russians because we thought we were going to fight them. <laughs> So I, we couldn't get on their zone. They couldn't. Get, but I, I established a good relation with him. Uh, he spoke a little English. He was a well-trained officer. He, he went through the academy, Russian academy. But we became good friends. He, and he used to take me over to his headquarters, about 20 miles down the road from from the uh, border. And see, uh, Austria was liberated by us. We call it a liberated country. It wasn't conquered like we did in Germany. But the Russians, they were just the opposite. They said, we conquered. You fought us. You've, you joined the Germans. Therefore, you are our enemy. But they had to. 
They couldn't fight the, with the army that uh, Hitler had, and uh, Austria didn't have an army. Hmm? So they didn't, they, when I went to their zone, they were in the combat positions. They had foxholes, uh, uh, they had towers, and people were restricted to where they could go. And when I went in, every time, every, every 500 yards, I stopped me. I stopped the vehicle, and I wanted to know who I was. Of course, he was a captain. He finally got, we, we got down to the main headquarters, and uh, we met, I met the general there. And, and, uh, but anyway, I, I, that's how I, uh, I got to Austria. And then after that, they moved me to uh, my wife's hometown. My whole life had came over that somebody else took over from our, our patrol there, and I became a security officer, security NCO for the for the little town where my wife uh, was going to school. It so happened that I had my own headquarters, and talking about uh, trying to change, uh, trying to put people together, they gave me all the eight balls, the Hispanic eight balls. <laughs> He says, Abel, you're Hispanic, you train him, and you take care of them. You know, they get, get drunk and all. So they gave me a bunch of, uh, what they call, eight balls. But we, I trained him, and, and uh, they did a good job for me. But not only was I security, I also was the honor guard commander. So anytime the, uh, somebody came, some diplomat or uh, officer or general came in, I, I had to have a special guard for them. And of course, that's how my wife knew me because she she would see me out and then because we took the big hotel downtown, we took over the hotel, my headquarters because I was uh, about two blocks away from them. I had a private uh, uh, building that I that I ran with my guards, my security, and her school was ac across from my headquarters, and uh, that's how we met. And, and uh, you know, we had a. Because I, I wasn't, I wasn't interested in, in getting married or anything like that. I, hey, I was 100% for the army. I, I could care less what the other guys were doing. Hey, I'm going to do a good job. So I didn't pay too much attention to her. Uh, I paid attention to what, okay, am I doing my job right? And we have a full uh, colonel that ran the city. He was a, a good military governor for the, uh, for the uh, army, for the United States Army. Of course, I, I, I fell under his command, so I had, I had to be make sure that everything was secure, the theater, the PA, post exchange, and, and they, they have a, a few, uh, a couple of American families there. My commander, Captain Riffey, his wife was there, so and they had a home for her. I had to make sure they were secure and all that. And, uh, but I was well known there in, in her hometown. They knew me because the way I dressed, I mean, I, I wear all this stuff that uh, Honor Guard wears, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, jump boots, white laces, and all that. You know, we, so they, they knew me. They knew who the guy was. Hey, that. And uh, so that's how, that's how I met her. Did, did you stalk her in the street, or, or how did you guys end up? No, I, I, I talked to her in, in front of my headquarters. I talked to her. Then and, and her. Uh, her cousin, her cousin, and her brother used to come to our mess hall, which was the big hotel. I didn't have a mess hall in my in my building. They used to come and pick up the the waste that we had. I, I made sure I told my mess sergeant. I said, make sure that you, you save that waste. There's a couple of young kids are here, Austin coming in. They're okay. You give them all the waste. What I didn't know is that way was going to my wife's house, and they were raising a pig, you know. and, and that's what they, they fed him with, you know, co besides corn, they fed all that. But that was my wedding present. Her dad uh, slaughtered the pig, and we had a big party there at his house. <laughs> so I fed my pig. <laughs> how, how old were you, and how old was she? When you oh, she was 16, and I was uh, 13. <laughs> I was eight, uh, 19, uh, 19 yeah, or 20, I think, 20 years old, yeah. But I met her family and, and uh, uh, her dad, her brother, because her brother used to come down and, 
and her all her cousins. Um, and uh, her mother used to do all my laundry because uh, I used to change three times a day to make sure I go over there and, and see her. <laughs> so she couldn't figure out why this, why this, uh, this uh, sergeant always has changed so many times. <laughs> but, so it became bigger. And I met all her sisters, and I brought her, when her mother died, I brought her dad here, and they lived with us until he passed away. I brought two of his sisters. Uh, one of them is married uh, and lives in uh, Arkansas, and the other one is married, and her husband is, a, is an attorney and a, and a reverend in, in Mexico in Guadalajara. She married a Hispanic, uh, a young man from uh, Mexico. Uh, so they all, they, of course, they have, they have three children. One, one daughter is married to a, a, a professor of, uh, teaches at one of their um, schools over there. And uh, she's, I think she's already received her, her degree and uh, she's a reverend now, her, the young lady. And uh, they got two sons. Uh, both of them work for uh, the computer experts. They work for the American companies, but they, they work out of uh, Mexico, out of Guadalajara. They travel, they come here to Austin, go to school, special school. But uh, that's how we, we met, and, and uh, uh, they've always, they accepted me as their son, and I accepted uh, her as, as my wife. <laughs> Wells, uh, Austria, between Salzburg and Vienna, the main highway. Uh, that's what she, her hometown is. But she had a lot of uh, the well-known in, in 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 that town. Her 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 uncle has a big construction company. Uh, big construction company that builds all kinds of uh, buildings there around that area. Uh, and one of his sons is. Uh, uh, he uh, does um, uh, stonework, um, uh, you know, head head for the uh, cemetery. Those um, tombstones. Tombstones, yeah. And every every city that that they put a, t a stone. I mean, a special uh, whatever is an angel, and he builds them. <coughs> He's, uh, he runs a he lives in a little town uh, not too far from there, and. And he uh, he provides uh, uh, fields for the kids to play and, and uh, something like H E B, you know. <laughs> so it's so every time we go over there, we have a good time because uh, I don't have to worry about finding a place to go. And her brother, <coughs> her brother, uh, married a German girl, and he's right right across the border from Austria. It's only an hour from an hour drive from uh, her brother to 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 my wife's house, and she has sister there, in uh, right there in Lambach is the name, of, and she uh, and she has um, a big farm, and uh, her husband passed away, and and she uh, raises fish. What do you call it? Fishery. She has fishery, you know. So every time we go there, she. Kills the big fish, the biggest fish he has for us. <laughs> so, so no one gave you any grief about you marrying a non-American? No, uh, my mother uh, kept saying, "Are you sure? You know, hey, we got a lot of Hispanic girls over here. Why, 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 why do you want to get? You know, she, she was afraid I was going to stay over there or something like that. But after that, uh, after I, I convinced them that." Uh, she was a Christian girl, and uh, she wanted to come to the United States. And she came, of course, when she came over, I was going to college, so she stayed with my mom. My mom doesn't speak any English, so she speaks Spanish better than I can now, my, my wife. Yeah, she gives lectures in Spanish, you know, you name it. She, she does. She's a very intelligent person. And she's very, very much involved in, in, in our church. Uh, of course, I have a son who's a pastor. I have a grandson who's a youth pastor. I have a, uh, a granddaughter that's uh, ch in charge of the uh, um, 
music in, in the church. So they're all involved in it. And my wife always been involved. She always worked. Every time I was in the Army, she, every place we were moving, first thing she said, Let's all, I want to talk to the chaplain. I want to work with him. She taught Sunday schools and all kinds of that. And of course, we, we moved to uh, uh, the Philippines, stayed there four years, and, and, and we met a missionary over there, uh, Reverend Morocco in Morocco, and uh, she taught um, the uh, college students, uh, medical school, there's a medical school right next to the church, and, they, and she had over 60 young people from the medical school that used to come, and once a week they have uh, their uh, Bible school, Bible training. Because she didn't speak Tagalog, but she, she spoke the other people speak English over there. But uh, it's been a wonderful journey for her and me together. And she raised my kids when I was, most of the time I was gone. They didn't know me. They said, who's he? I come and say, that's your dad. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I send my picture every, every, every month so they can see how I look like. But we kept in contact. Of course, my oldest son, uh, he spent uh, a year in Vietnam at the same time I was there. And that's hard on my wife when both of us were there. I was on a Delta, and he was up north. And he was Special Forces, too. And he was uh, probably had a very dangerous job, more dangerous than mine. He was what they call, uh, they dropped those guys behind the lines, and they uh, stayed there for a week and listened to the uh, what the enemy is doing, what what the movements, what kind of equipment they have, and then they extract them at night with helicopters, bring them back in. You know? So I said, Thomas, and you want to volunteer again? So no, no, I don't. Oh, no worries. He had to, he had this. Uh, he he, but it was hard for my wife for both of us in uh, being there together, and and because uh, uh, we kept in touch all the time. Uh, but she raised all my kids. They, they all went to, uh, some of them were uh, school trained. They were, because uh, I, I have three daughters, they're all uh, school teachers. And because uh, they sent them to college, to, they went to uh, Christian schools. And I wonder if you, uh, what's the name of the school you went to? San Antonio Christian School. Yeah, I know what that, that's, that's, uh, Yeah, no, you move, but uh, yeah, that's where my granddaughters went to school there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, I think I know her. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, yeah, that's uh, it's a, it's a small street there, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so, yeah, right close to cha Channel Sixty down there. Yeah, yeah I, I used to take him there all the time. I used to come in, come Basie Basie Road, and uh, then get on Blanco, and then get on. Uh, Going on that road there, and uh, right close to Barrios, right close to Barrios, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, you know, it has to be one of the velas, you know, because uh, <laughs> she, she's a singer. They all, they all sing. My wife's a good singer too. They won't let me sing in the bathtub either. <laughs> That's funny. Did you want to take a quick break? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking. Well, we, we were covering uh, my uh, service, uh, different uh, uh, units that I was doing the service. I think we got up to Indiana University, Assistant Professor of Military Science. And then on uh, 62, 63, uh, I went to Vietnam as a senior advisor to the 21st Field Artillery Battalion, 21st Division, the Vietnamese Division. And at the end of uh, that tour, 63, I came back to, back to the 82nd Airborne and joined the 3, 320 Artillery Battalion. And then about that same year, I I volunteered to go into Special Forces. So in '64, I went to Special Forces, uh, took my training, uh, took the language, and I took uh, counterinsurgency uh, courses. Then I went to Vietnam with Special Forces. 
while I was there, I uh, I was uh, the uh, assistant commander of a B uh, C team. That's the whole. The C team covers the whole core area, the fourth core area, and uh, we have different. Uh, B detachments all over the core area, and I was excited also for the C detachment. After that, uh, within six months, I moved uh, in 65. I went to be the senior advisor to the Special Forces Officers Training School, where we train Vietnamese officers to become Special Forces. We trained them, and I went, I went with them on operations and taught them everything that uh, a Special Forces officer has, ha, must know. When that tour was over, I came back and went to the commanding general staff school in Leavenworth, Kansas. I was there for a year. As, as soon as I finished my course, I uh, applied to go to work for the State Department as an advisor. Uh, in Vietnam, and I was accepted because of my combat experience, language, and knowing the culture of the people. So I was sent back. I'm, I became the advisor to the to one of the provincial governors or state governor. I was his advisor. I advised him on uh, use of uh, our military equipment, such as helicopters. Uh, Air, uh, Air Force uh, strikes to get to be able to use the Air Force properly and go on operation with him. Everything that has to do with tactics, I was his advisor. So I spent a lot of time with, uh, with the governor, not only with him, but with the assistant. And uh, after I got through, through that course, with that <laughs> assignment, I came back in 69, came back to, to uh, the Army. I have to, the Army gave me on loan. I was on loan to, uh, to the State Department. So during that time, uh, I wasn't assigned to the Army, wasn't paying me, the State Department. They were taking care of all my family. Uh, paying for all my bills. They flew my family from the States all the way to the Philippines, provide, provide them with a house and a, 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 with the embassy. And I was able to see them at least every six weeks I would be able to come back from Vietnam and spend some time with them. And then I go back for another six weeks. And I had three tours. Every, if you had to sign a, a contract for a year, I signed the first contract, second and third. The fourth one, I, my wife said, no more. So we came back. She said, let's get out of the service. Why don't we start our own business? So in 69, the latter part of 69, I came back to uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, became an instructor at the counterinsurgent school until, until I was discharged, I was there, until I retired. I retired in January 1970. Immediately, I moved back to San Antonio and uh, starting, uh, I put an application for to start a business, and the first opportunity was McDonald's. So I uh, worked on it until I was able to get the franchise. And I s stayed with McDonald's until uh, 2003. I sold my stores back to McDonald's, and retire after you know after almost 80 years old I felt it was time to say goodbye so what do you do now in your free time free time I work for a young lady her name is Angela Vela and she keeps me very busy <laughs> <laughs> yeah I work with the uh, we have a big home we have to maintain it uh, and uh, I do some uh, I, I work with uh, other organizations here in town. I uh, belong to different uh, associations. 
I work with the Purple Heart Association here in San Antonio. I also uh, do some work for my church. And I help my grandkids and my, uh, they're, sometimes they, they, they spend a week with us. So uh, that's, that's what keeps, you know, being a grandfather, great grandfather is, is a lot of fun. Do you have um, one overall memory, I guess, about the war, whether it was good or bad, that you'd like to share? Oh, I have so many of them. Of course, uh, the one, first one. For me. Uh, Nora Frost, take two, with uh, Abel Bella in San Antonio. Okay, I'm sorry, you were telling us about your World War II uh, memory that you'd like to share? Okay, the one uh, World War II American uh, that I want to share is uh, the time we liberated the uh, Jewish people that were in a concentration camp. It was a bad sight. When we went in, I was with the uh, advance detachment or the reconnaissance. We came in and uh, the Germans, SS, they were gone. So we went in and all the doors were locked. We opened the first one. Uh, a room 10 by 10, they had over 200 people inside, stacked like wood. We opened the door, they start, they start falling out, the ones that were dead. And uh, terrible. And the ones that were able to get out, they walked out and they started eating grass, bark of the trees, whatever they could get their hands on. Uh, they were eating the their own animals, the cows and uh, horses, whatever they could hands on. I think that was a real, real memory that I'll never forget, the sight that I saw. Not only old people, but young kids. And uh, some of them were uh, no more than 10 years old. And they were skin and bone. But most of them didn't have any hair there. Their hair was all taken off and they were completely covered with lice. So immediately uh, we got the DDT and we started spraying them uh, as many as we can, uh, the ones that were alive. But you could see, I saw something terrible. I saw a young body lying down and as soon as he died, about an hour, two hours later, the lice started jump into the other bodies that were alive because they knew exactly that there was no blood there for them. They couldn't live. The other one is uh, my lieutenant. He ran over a mine. The war is already over and we're moving from one location to the other. Ran over a mine, turned the tank over uh, and uh, burn all of them, the whole crew, including the lieutenant, and we had to pull them out of the vehicle afterwards. Uh, you know, pieces of legs and bodies uh, were strewed all over the place. Those are the thing, ones that really uh, I, rec I recall, mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll never forget. Then they have other ones. Uh, of course, World War, uh, Vietnam, we can talk about that. Maybe we can talk about the uh, first time I was wounded in 62, and then later in 65. In 62, we were on, uh, on an operation, a helicopter operation, and we left our operation area. I think we had 15 helicopters. I was in the leading one with the colonel. Uh, he's sitting right next to my, he's sitting right next to my, on this side, and uh, as we were approaching the target area, uh, we heard some firing, and I thought I was the one that hit, but I looked around and my whole, this whole side of me was all full of blood. Actually, the colonel when I got hit, but the blood was spilling on me, and I thought it was me. So as soon as we hit the target where they was going to drop us up, I just pushed the colonel over, and by the time the the floor was full of blood. I slid and I jumped out uh, and I told the pilot, go ahead and take him home. Yeah? So the, 
uh, that, that day we traveled all day long. It was in the Delta. And uh, uh, finally that evening we stopped. We set up perimeter along a, a canal. The next morning at 5 o'clock we started getting troops ready to go across the canal uh, to hit our next target. <coughs> as soon as I crossed the canal, machine guns were firing from all directions. The VC, they had prepared the area all night long. They worked on it. I don't know why we, we never heard any noise, <coughs> but everything was booby-trapped. Uh, they had all field of fire. Any, any approach we could get into their area, they had it covered with fire. <coughs> I had my lieutenant my two sergeants, <clears throat> I, I was the only one that had a radio, so I had to go forward uh, because we had a machine gun that was pinning the whole company up front of me, Vietnamese company, and they were cutting them to pieces. So I ran uh, towards where the machine gun was, and I only, I only had the map, so I looked at the map, and I had communication with the with a jet uh, above us, and before I got to the machine gun, I stepped on a mine. And five minutes later, I woke up, and I thought I lost my leg, because I, when I saw the other young soldiers, the Vietnamese, losing arms, legs. And, but I think uh, the Lord took care of me. I only had a shrapnel on my buttock. Uh, I lost my boot where I stepped on it. But I was able to continue and was able to silence the machine gun. And as soon as I was able to do that, I came back and the colonel uh, said, uh, Captain, I said, we need, we need helicopter. We got all these people wounded. I said, I only have one helicopter, sir. Uh, I said, but before we do it, I, I'll make the decision what, who goes first. So I saw some. A couple of kids that were arms, one arm blown off, the other leg. I said, I want those two. He said, no, no, I don't need those. The colonel said, they're going to die. I want you to take these other ones. That I said, sir, no, the policy of American is to save every soul we can, and we're going to take the worst one first. I said, if you want to use the helicopter, then you have to follow my instructions. I was, I was controlling everything. See? That was part of my job, to provide them with, with uh, uh, medical evac, and air support, and artillery support if, if uh, we had some. Anyway, we, we, uh, we worked from 6 o'clock in the morning until about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, taking, moving bodies over to the uh, main uh, operations center. And from there, they flew them over to Saigon. And the colonel kept calling me, my colonel, the American colonel, said, hey, well, Come on down. I said, we need you. We, I need you to, we need to go to the hospital. I said, no, I'm, I'm staying until I move everybody out. I said, well, the general's here. General train is, uh, the general was there from the MACV uh, general. He wants you. He's got, a hell, he's got his plane here. He's going to fly you over to Saigon so you can get treated. <laughs> I said, sir, I'm not going until. I said, well, I, I hate to give you the rock order, but I said, just give me another 10 minutes and we'll, I'll move everybody out. And finally, I'll move the last. Soldier, we lost. We lost at least. It's only about 38 people left that were be able to fight. The rest of them, they're all wounded. And when I got uh, to the operation center, the general was there, and uh, uh, the first thing he said, "You need a shot." So I went over to the medics and uh, I told this doctor who was there, a Vietnamese doctor. I said, I, "I need a shot." So he took his needle out and I said, "Have you?" Is it sanitized? Oh, yeah. Stuck in his mouth. That's the way they sanitized it. <laughs> so I went to spend a week in Saigon. So uh, they patched me up and I came right back. That was the first time that uh, I was wounded. The second time, 65, and I have a picture to show you. And you're going to see the horrible thing that happened in Saigon. I went to for a meeting, and the two colonels that were with me, 
they they work in Saigon. One of them, a good friend of mine, they we, we trained together, and uh, he said, "Let's go and have something to eat." So I said, oh, we'll do, "I'm gonna take you because they were from Saigon," and uh, as we were walking by this restaurant, we heard that bomb go off. So I looked around. The two colonels took off. Man, they were gone. So. I said, look, these people need help. So I, so I ran inside the restaurant, and uh, I started attending to the wounded people. I knew there was a second explosion coming out, because there usually is uh, two explosions. First, they want to make sure that you run up front, to, and then they, they, they turn the other bomb all on, the Claymore mine. And uh, so I was waiting for the second. But I was down. I was down below. Uh, There's two two-story restaurant. It's a floating restaurant. What it was, and uh, I was able to work at least four or five people down below. Then I heard some crying upstairs, so I knew the second blast had already gone off. So I ran upstairs on the stairs, and uh, I saw a couple of people, the big holes on the uh, on the back of their. Uh, beh uh, below the neck, so I took a tablecloth and rolled it up, turned them over, and then I saw another guy with uh, arm shot off. So I put a nocturne on him. Then I, then I look up across to my right, and I saw this lady sitting on this table, like she was sleeping. I went over there, I checked her; she was dead. And while I was looking at her, from the corner of my eye, I saw something moving. There was a gentleman. A big guy, I say, uh, over 200 pounds, lying face down, and between his legs, I saw this little shoe moving, and it was an American shoe. So I said, it must be an American young kid. So I turned him over, and it was his daughter, a Vietnamese. Married, he was married to a Vietnamese lady, and he had been hit. Piece of shrapnel went through her little leg and down through his uh, belly, his stomach, and killed him, but she was still alive. I picked her up. When I picked her up, her little leg fell out and her little bone stuck out. And so I grabbed her little leg like this, and then I start. About that time, I, all, all these people were coming in, photographers and all this, and um, the MPs were coming in. I said, Sir, I said, this is an American girl. I know she's got American shoes. We're gonna take her to the hospital. I don't care what what you guys are gonna do, but I'm going. So I went downstairs, and they had a jeep for me there, and uh, we put her on on that vehicle, and took her to the hospital. I stayed with her until three o'clock in the morning, then I had to go back and uh, uh, to the hotel where I stayed. Uh, of course, I had a white shirt, so it was completely red when I, completely full of blood when I got to the hotel. I changed. And about that time, uh, I got a call. It says the Red Cross wants to talk to you. So I walked over the, picked up the phone. and says, "You got to come back to the United States to America, to San Antonio. Your sister is a. She only has a few days to live. She's got cancer. I said, and we need you back here as soon as we, uh, we'll set up the transportation to get you back." So immediately, uh, I went back to my office, picked up my uh, equipment I had, whatever I needed, my passport, and I got on the first plane. And uh, within 36 hours, I was uh, next to my sister. And uh, but a miracle happened. The doctor said that she was a terminal case, and she had a few days to live, but she lived to. She recover and live for 40 more years. Wow. Until uh, two, year, three years ago, she passed. She had now this one was uh, she cancer of the liver. There's nothing we can do about it. So that that's uh, I'll never forget. Now let me finish with the story. When I came back to the states, I worked for general. Uh, I was the, one of the instructors and the. Colonel in charge of the school was Colonel Martell. He went to uh, to the Pentagon, and 
he talked to his friend of mine, uh, Colonel C. He says, C, he says, I got to find that that major to save my li my 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 daughter. I uh, that uh, her her father, it was Sergeant Martinez. He was uh, a Special Forces guy. He was killed. His mother, Vietnamese, was killed. So I adopted her and her sister, and they're here with me in, in uh, Fort Bragg. So I need to find the guy that saved me, saved my girl. He says, it was Major Vela. I said, Major Vela, he's worked for me. So he came back from Sa Saigon, I mean, from Saigon. he came from the Washington, came back and he called me right away and said, Abel, you were the one that saved my daughter. I said, in the restaurant? Yeah, yep. He said, well, I want you to see her. She's here, but I don't want you to mention nothing about what happened. So I had a chance to see her. My wife had a chance to see her. And she was still working with a limp. She had a number of uh, operations. Because the hole was about that big, you know, right here, it went right through here. Isn't that a miracle, you know, be able to? And I, I think for me it was a miracle that I was just happened to be there, and I didn't, I didn't decide to run like the other two colonels did. I said, I'm gonna, hey, I'm here to save lives, and I can, I'm not gonna do it uh, by running away. Let's find out what we can do. This is training that we received uh, in Special Forces. This is training that we receive in the Army. And uh, again, I think the attitude that you have, because I heard a lot of people say, well, I hope, I hope the Vietnamese kill themselves. You know, we don't, they don't want to fight. I said, no, you, you got to work with them. You got to, hey, you got to motivate them. He said, well, it's your, their country. I know it's their country. I said, but if you've been fighting for 30 years, you think you, you don't lose your, your will to fight? <laughs> I said, you got to give them something to fight for. And uh, so I, I, I uh, I really established some good relationship with these people. I mean, every time they come to Lackland to go to, uh, to the language school, the Vietnamese, they always came to my house because they knew where I live, and my wife would receive them and fix them, stop her, whatever. But uh, uh, we became very good friends, and uh, too bad that I don't communicate with them anymore because uh, I don't know what happened to them after the war. Some of them were there. They're dead, but now I'm pretty sure. But uh, those are the two incidents. Uh, there's another one, a third one, and that happened in, in uh, an operation in Canto, which is also in the Delta. I had two pilots that worked for me, for me uh, or the colonel that I worked for, but uh, two of this, uh, two captains. One of them was getting ready to leave, to go home, and with his, to visit his, his family, to be with his family, because he had put a, a year uh, tour there, and this new guy was coming in. He says, I'm going to take you over. Hey, this is Major Vela. I want you to meet him. He'll give you all the support you need. I said, let's take over. Let's take over. I'm going to show you the area operation, the area that you have to keep an eye on, this Viet Cong. So both of them got on the airplane, and about five minutes later, here they come back. They had been shot, and the brake lines were shot. They couldn't stop. So when they hit the, when they hit the uh, uh, landing, landing strip, they couldn't stop, and they went all the way to the end, and there was a big canal in the end. The airplane turned over, and I worked for two hours trying to save them. I couldn't lift up. The, we had a, a wrecker came in. I had a helicopter. Finally, we we got a second wrecker and finally pulled them out. By the time we pulled them out, uh, the doctor was there. Our doctor was there, and, and we pulled both of them out because uh, immediately we we gave them artificial respiration. And the doctor stuck them a needle in their heart, and we tried to save them, both of them. But the really sad thing is that I, being an exec, also had to write the letter to his wife, and I had to go through their personal items to make sure that they, the, the, the right things went home. And I saw the both letters. The guy leaving says, honey, I'm so glad. I really enjoy working with Special Forces people. They're great people. And he says, we have a great guy. They all support us here, Major Vela. Says, He'll do anything for us. Says, and uh, I'm getting my new replacement. He's coming in to, uh, tonight. And I'm going to show him the area, and then I'll be going home. I'll meet you in Hawaii. Bring, you to, bring our two daughters. Oh, he never made it. And the other guy, same thing. He says, honey, I just got my assignment. I'm working with Special Forces here in Kanto uh, or in the Delta. I think that the best assignment I can, 
and I'm looking forward to be talking to you later, and maybe we can go to Hawaii later on. And his, that was the end of his uh, life. Uh, it could have been me, you know. But by the grace of God, we, uh, we're here. But so those are the things that we have to go through. And you have to have that unction to go on. You can't stop. You got to go on. Uh, you retired, and uh, you retired as a major? Right. And you're very well accomplished, and um, I know that you have many honors with you. What yeah. Kind of yeah. Would you, should, should we break or? No, 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 no we're okay. okay. Uh, I was going to say something else before you, before we go with the honors. But, uh, you, know, you get sometimes this senior citizen moments, you know, <laughs> thing disappears. Uh, You know, the, uh, <clears throat> the people that should be honored are those people that are not here. And those people that gave their life for our freedom, they're the ones that should be honored. And even though we give medals, uh, I think we should remember them all the time and keep them in our prayers. Their families too, you know. Because <clears throat> I got a letter from that lady later on, and, and uh, it was very hard for her, for both of them. But they thanked me for taking time, and I was able to tell them that uh, they died doing what they wanted to do. You know? Doing what the, they, uh, it wasn't their heart. Uh, so, I wear these medals and I wish, I feel proud to wear the uniform. Not for me. But for for those young men that gave that yeah, it's very hard. Uh, <clears throat> see, that's why we don't like to talk about things like this, because it uh, it touches your heart and. Uh, If you don't, uh, you know, take time to think about it and, and cry about it, it's always inside you. Inside your your system, you gotta, gotta, it's gotta come out. You gotta come out. <clears throat> so. Uh, Every chance I have, I, I like to wear my uniform to show them that uh, uh, we still remember them and we'll never forget them. Never, never. Uh, I have very good friends that they never made it back. Major Ratliff, one of my good friends, we four break together. Uh, he was getting ready to go home and got on a helicopter. He never made it. Yeah. But I, I, it could have happened to me too. I was shot once from a helicopter, and, and we were able to make it out of there. You know, uh, I jumped from there uh, three thousand feet, and my chute didn't open. Uh, my reserve couldn't. I couldn't get my reserve. <coughs> As soon as I opened my reserve, my main chute opened a little bit, 
and my reserve got between my legs and got all ra wrapped up. And you mean within within a few seconds, I could go through a whole my my whole life you know, as as I went down. And I looked down and I saw the ground coming. And pretty soon, just before it hit, it blossom again, and I was able to to make it. But those are the miracles that uh, we see every day and, and uh, we experience in combat. Uh, uh, you know, sometimes uh, we go to the checkpoint and, and nothing happens and the guy right behind you comes by and then blow him up. Uh, 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 it's hard for me to explain why, but it's, it, it happens in combat zone. So my ribbons, they belong to them, but I can explain the Purple Heart, you get it, you can get it dead or you can get it alive. <laughs> so I'd rather have it alive. <laughs> but I'm, I, I wasn't looking for Purple Hearts. <laughs> That's taking a big chance. <laughs> I wasn't like, uh, what's the name of this guy who ran for president? T uh, John uh, McCain. No, no, the other guy. Kerry. Kerry, yeah. He, he, he had, uh, he had uh, seven of them or something. <laughs> Every time he cut his finger, he, he put in for one. <laughs> yeah, but not not of uh, you know, some of those kids. That, they are, they they weren't looking for purple heart. They weren't looking for medals. They were trying to do their job, and, and they wanted to get the war over as soon as possible. I talked to General Mc, uh, General Westmoreland a number of times when he used to come down and brief him, and he says, "Able, this is." I, I have a big responsibility. I gotta get this kid back home. He says, "Can you do? <coughs> can you have any ideas how we can win this war?" I said, "You're from San Antonio." I said, "Yeah." He said, "I tell you what I'll do. You give me an idea how to win this war, and I'll bring the Alamo over here." <laughs> so I wasn't the only one worrying about uh, bringing those troop back. You know? But being in the front lines with them, you 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 you're closer to them, you you're rubbing so shoulders with them. But those generals, they have the same feelings. You know. yeah, the president of the United States, they, he has the same feeling. I th he hates to send people to war, but he has to. You know. uh, so I have um, I also have the. <coughs> The Vietnamese, they gave me the Medal of Honor. Their Medal of Honor, one of them is one, I don't know which one it was. But I was given that medal because uh, of the work I did with them. Um, and of course, I have a good conduct because I was a good boy when I was uh, an enlisted man. And I have the uh, European Theater Operation with one star, Central Europe. And the Vietnamese operation, I don't know how many of them, I can't put them all the stars in there. Because for every, uh, every time you went on an operation, there was a star. <coughs> now in Europe, was, there were campaigns, you know, central campaign, there was this, uh, but not um, in Vietnam, it's in every day. I mean, it looked like every day we went on operation. I, I, I had to keep these people going on operation. That was my job, to motivate them, say, we got to go and fight, sir. It's not tomorrow. Tomorrow is my birthday. I said, we, I said, we don't stop for birthdays. <laughs> well, Buddha's birthday or something like that. <coughs> of course, the other on on this side, being working with the Vietnamese, I had to. I said, I dealt with them, and I saw when the soldiers died, I had to be there. Of course, their their system uh, is different than ours. You know, they're not uh, they're not Christians. You know? I mean, they when they have a funeral, they have they bring food and and all this stuff, you know. And then, then you go to the to the cemetery and you eat with them, and and then the next day they invite you to their home. They have a chair, empty chair. He says, "That's my wife. They got killed. She's there." Of course, I know. He says, "Hey, well, you, Major, you don't, you guys don't believe that." I said, "But her spirit is there, you know. Do you believe in the spirit?" I said, "I believe. Well, her spirit is there. I know she's not physically there, but her spirit is there." Oh, his spirit is there. My husband's spirit is there. He was killed. But I tell you, uh, I've seen su such terrible things over there, it's especially out in the village level. Uh, we used to send uh, the village level uh, commanders or captains. 
And man, they don't want to go that far. They don't want to go down the village because it's so dangerous. This captain came over to me and said, oh, Major Vela says, can you help me? I said, Colonel wants to send me to the village. And I just got married and, and uh, uh, my wife has a big family. I have a big family. And the way we make it is we put them all together. They make a big pot of rice and everybody sticks the rice from the same bowl. Is and we put everything together uh, like a commune. I said, if, we, if I go over there, uh, it's going to break my family up. I said, can you help me? I want to talk to the colonel. He said, no, it's just time for you to go. He's a good captain. He, I can rely on him. He, he knows uh, operations, and uh, he's loyal to me. And he's not going to turn me over to the Viet Cong. So he goes. A, a week later, we have to go and, and, and save him. When we get there, they... <clears throat> They burned his father, the two gasoline, his father-in-law, put gasoline and, and struck a match on him. Uh, his wife, uh, they, uh, they opened her stomach and they took his head and stuck it in her stomach. And terrible like that. Uh, but this is the thing that we saw there. Or, or the young... Uh, Soldiers that come in, they just, you know, just throw them on the on the ground, the parade field or the soccer field. And they stay there two, three days until say, somebody picks them up. You know, all full of clay or mud, whatever it is. You can't see. I said, sir, I said, we got a body. Oh, it's okay. I said, oh, don't worry about it. It's uh, you know, it's our system. You say, hey, I'm a Vietnamese. You're American. Okay, you have a beliefs. I have my beliefs. I said, but that's not right. Sir. You can't go out there and take the chickens away from the farmer. Oh, yeah, we can. I said, we provide security for them. We give you security, then we take the chickens. <laughs> I said, no, sir, we got to work the other way. You, gotta, you have to gain the mind and the heart of these people. You got to uh, get them on your side. You're not doing it by that, but doing bad. Bad doesn't uh, be gotten e e Good, I said, or evil, I said, you can't do evil uh, and, and get, <laughs> get uh, good things out of it. So, you know, those are the things that we had to, very discouraging, very, um, always under pressure, and uh, you feel that, uh, you know, that you want to st stick something in their mind so <laughs> they can think the way you do. But it's, you can't, you can't, that's, that's the way they are. They, uh, I don't know, I compared to a guy who likes to eat a lot, you know, he tried to take the food away from him. He gets mad. <laughs> I say, even if he knows that. But people know that, hey, you, you smoke marijuana, you're going you, you, you to hell and or you're going to kill yourself. Or you smoke, you're going to get uh, cancer of the lungs. Oh, no, that's okay. <laughs> Okay. How have you seen the generations different among all of them? Like how how was your lifestyle different growing up than say what now um, your great grandchildren experience? One of the things that I see is uh, maybe our parents were weren't trained properly, but uh, they they demanded certain things from you. Discipline was very important. And when somebody walked inside the house, you stood up and you greet the individual. And then you bow down, then you, then you move out of the room. You don't stay there. Uh, and then you eat whatever we give you. Now, in our case, we never get any seconds. We don't have that much food. But I see some of my grandkids, they, oh, I don't want that. Oh, they eat a sandwich, they leave the outside, you just eat this inside, they leave the outside, or a pizza. I says, young man, I said, you're throwing that away, that's money. I said, eat everything. And we had to eat everything, man. And we used to fight for that, for that, for the grill uh, pan, because we used to scrape it with a tortilla. <laughs> and then they want everything. They, they, they want to, when they get out of school, they want to have a big house, they want to have a car, and they want to go on vacation, and they want to have a good job that pays more than anybody else gets. <laughs> Wait a minute. Hey, you got to work yourself up. 
those are the things that we learned in, in, uh, in the way we were brought up. And we, we never argued with my parents. We never told them you're wrong. We never say, hey, well, Johnny uh, over there, he's doing it. Why can't I do it? No, you better not say that because <laughs> your ears were gone. <laughs> But this new new way of raising a family that you gotta uh, you know give importance and uh, you gotta respect the person. Yeah, you have to. Sure, I know. You gotta be. Uh, you don't have to cuss at them. And, but I think when time gets, when time says, hey, you gotta go, you gotta go. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> and uh, and I'm the type. See, being a military man, <laughs> sometimes I say, you're too hard on the grandkids. I say, yeah, well, they have to learn, man. He said, well, it's not our job to do that, their parents. He said, sometimes we look at their parents. I mean, we can see uh, uh, sometimes they they come from, uh, you know, I got a granddaughter in, uh, in, uh, uh, <coughs> in uh, Colorado, not Colorado, but, uh, uh, oh, man, I have to forget. Anyway, when they come, they went come. We have extra rooms, and we provide them the rooms wherever they need. Uh, but then the kids come in, and, and there's, they have they show them three different types of cereals. You want this one, this one, or this one. That's the way. You not the way to do. It. Oh, you don't want it? Don't, no, no, you didn't. Okay, well, no, I don't want that. What do you want? Well, I want an apple. Okay, here's the apple. Two wine by then and throw it away. I said, wait, that's not. That's waste, wasteful. Especially right now with the cost of food going up. Even when I, I'm going to buy my wife, my wife a bicycle, she can ride. <laughs> well, that's the, that's what I see in, in the kids. Of course, they're very concerned about the education, and uh, they they want to give them the best. But they got to earn it. If you don't earn it, you're not going to take care of it. And uh, that's what. Uh, we tried to practice that with the Vietnamese too. I said, you got to earn it before you can get it. <laughs> if you do a good job, we'll, we'll bring you more support. If you don't do a good job, we can't support you. We got to have somebody else that, that's doing a good job because we don't have enough for everybody. So, uh, uh, of course, you, you, I believe in, uh, of course, you got to encourage people. That's what people don't don't realize that it, it, I need encouragement. I think everybody needs encouragement. You, sometimes you go down, you, you, know, you, you face a, a, a problem, and, and, you, and you sort of say, well, I'm going to give up. No. Go and talk to your friend. Hey, here's my problem. Can you help me? The same thing. He has to do the same. If you don't ask, you're not going to be, you're not going to get received. Ask, and it shall be given. <laughs> Oh, we English. 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 Well, most of the time we're in the service, so we uh, we spoke English. They, they all, they all. Uh, that's the bad thing is that uh, I have two daughters. They're, you know, they're they look like me. They the same color, and they go, they teach school, and uh, and uh, or they go to the restaurant, and they got the waitress or waiter said in Spanish, "Can I help you?" Say, what do you say? <laughs> they get a little upset. Hey, you know, Mexicana no habla español. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. When we were growing up, we couldn't spend, we couldn't speak Spanish in in, in class. Boy, the teacher will put your hands out there and bam, bam. You know? So that was a that wasn't a good idea <laughs> to to put you and uh, send you to the principal office because you speak Spanish, <laughs> even out in the class, even outside playing. You know? So we used to hide, <laughs> but uh, that's, uh, I see that uh, uh, obstacle that, that uh, it's, not, it's not good for, for our kids. But they should, second language is very important, especially right, right next to Mexico. You know, you, you go, any, any of the places you go there, they, they treat you, I mean, if you speak Spanish, well, they, they'll, they'll give you better service than you. Or oh, you dress nicely. You got there with uh, earrings and you know, all that stuff. <laughs> well, is there anything else you'd like to share? Um, you know, either advice or just something that you want to share? Generations that are going to be watching this video, or just any other 
<clears throat> yes, I must not to speak to the young people that don't ever quit. Keep going to school, and uh, I will highly recommend you to join one of the services because you are taking care of our country. You're keeping us, you're keeping us free. In the same token, you're getting something back. The services have a lot to offer, not only education, but discipline. And this is uh, the thing that sometimes we fail because we don't have any discipline. And if you have the discipline and you're determined and you're committed, you will succeed. You're going to make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Uh, if you're not making a mistake, they're not doing anything. You can sit at home on the couch and, and watch the novellas, and you're not going to make any mistakes. But take a chance, take a risk, but study, study the risks. Whatever you do, prepare for it. If you want to be uh, in the service, take ROTC or take some military subjects. If you're going to want to become a banker, then study finances, study uh, uh, the area uh, of business that you want to go in. Don't go in blind. Uh, you have to know your area that you're going to work. I'll never send someone in combat. He has never had any training in, in, in shooting a weapon. Same thing if I need a financial advisor. I don't want to get somebody that has never had any finances, never taken any anything that is related to finances, and put them in take over my uh, finances. So again, this is a great country, and uh, you know I, <clears throat> you know they call me Mexican. They call me Chicano, they call me uh, Bean Valley. I said, but I'm an American. I have a heritage. I have a he Mexican heritage. I'm proud of it. But first of all, I'm an American. And I will do anything to keep this country safe and sound. So my last word to you is, God bless you. God bless America.